Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. If you would honor the Lord by standing to your feet, I'm going to get down on my knees and let's go before the Lord together in prayer. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're so grateful we get to come into your house. Thank you, God, for what you've already done in this church service. Lord, I know that there's been healings, provisions, blessings, wisdom poured out, God, already. And Lord, we're just in awe of who you are and what you do, God. Very grateful for your presence in this place. Now, Holy Spirit, we'd ask that you'd come and be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the direction, the correction that we need for each and every one of our individual lives. God, as we open your word, we pray that you open it up to us. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. May we receive that word with meekness, God, readily submitted to what you would have us to do. God, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for that. Also, Lord, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. Lord, there are brothers and sisters, and no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anyone else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. Lord, we give you the praise and the glory. Be among them as you would be among us tonight, God. Bless them as you would bless us tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, amen. amen. You can have a seat. Get your Bible out. And as you're getting your Bible out, you might as well turn to Mark, the sixth chapter. We're going to launch out on Mark, the sixth chapter tonight. Tonight, I want to talk to you about the attack of lack. A lot of times in our lives, we find ourselves under attack, especially when we go into the wisdom of God for areas such as we have been in this church, talking about our finances, talking about tithes and offerings, talking about stewardship and that sort of a thing. In fact, I just received an email from somebody who said, you know what, for the first time this last weekend, I decided that I had just had enough of being miserable in my life, had enough of knowing what to do and not doing it, and so therefore, I just said, that's it. I know there's never going to be a good season. There's never going to be a good time. I'm just going to believe God and trust God with my tithe. And you know what happened to them? All hell broke loose against them. I mean, they just had thing after thing after thing after thing. And all throughout the the letter that they sent, they they were saying, you know, I'm chuckling, I'm laughing, I'm smiling, just so that we knew that, you know, all of this stuff wasn't getting them down, but that they knew that this was no coincidence, that the moment they decided to step out in faith, the moment they decided to trust God, that an attack came against their life. And oftentimes, we'll see this attack in an area of our lives called lack. In fact, in the days of old cities, when an army would attack and besiege a city, the people would shut themselves inside the walls of the cities, and they would shut the gates up tight. And if the attacking army couldn't build siege ramps against it, maybe there's a moat around it that they couldn't fill in, or maybe they just couldn't get close to the walls of the city because they were dumping oil or rocks or shooting arrows at them or something like that, often what the attacking army would do was that they would camp outside of the uh, area where they could be in harm's way, and they would completely encamp around the city, and then they would just sit there. Sometimes for months, they would wait, and they would wait, and they were wait. Why were they waiting? They were waiting for resources on the inside of those walls to run out. See, oftentimes, if there wasn't a natural spring or a river that was flowing into the city, there was a shortage or a lack of water. You don't only live so many days without water. Oftentimes, there was a lack of food. Maybe there was a lack of supplies if they could get in, and maybe they could shoot arrows and and that sort of a thing, but eventually they were going to run out of arrows. And so what that attacking nation would do is they would just camp, and they would wait it out, and they would attack that city with lack until lack finally forced them to give up and to give in and to surrender themselves and everybody inside the city. We see this all throughout the Bible. In fact, uh, some very famous stories in the Bible, things that are really impacting like Hezekiah and, and his men on the walls talking to the invading army and the invading army's talking in the Hebrew common language and they say, oh, no, 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 don't talk to us in the common language. They say, oh, no, we're going to talk to you in the common language. Why? Because they're trying to instill fear in the people. They're trying to get them to come over to their side. They're trying to get them to defect or show a weakness in the city. Now, lack can come to us in many ways in present day. The devil is no different. See, the Bible says that we are not unaware of his tactics. And therefore, we need to recognize and realize that when we start to follow the will and the way of God, that an attack will come against our lives. And sometimes that attack can come in this area of lack. See, the devil will camp around you. 
The devil will squeeze things off. The devil will try and keep resources away from you. Remember, the Bible says he comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. See, he will try and deplete your resources so that you will have lack in your life so that eventually he can kill you and destroy you. See, it starts with an attack of lack. He will steal, then kill and destroy. And so we need to be wise enough to realize and recognize that when we are following the will and the way of God, that it's not just a bed of roses, even though it is the highway of holiness, even though it is the right way, the narrow way, the road is narrow, but the way is hard to find. See, there is opposition. There's things that come against us. Jesus said in the world, you will have trouble. Have you noticed that you do have trouble in the world? That's not one of those promises of God that you have to believe God for or confess over your life or pray for, you know. We're not out there, but oh, God, I just believe you for trouble today, Lord. See, no, we don't have to do that. It just comes our way. In the world, you will have trouble. But Jesus said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So we can see this lack can come in many ways. Here, here's a couple ways that I was just thinking about. How about this, this, this lack? Lack of experience. Sometimes we feel that we're inadequate because we don't have enough experience in that area. I know somebody was telling me I was trying to get a job, but you know what? I just couldn't get it because I didn't have enough experience. See, lack can sometimes be an attack in your life. How about this, a lack of time? A lot of times we're so busy that the important things get pushed to the wayside in our busyness. And rather than prioritize and put first things first, sometimes things like prayer, things like getting into God's word, getting into God's presence, connecting with God, even church, can get pushed to the side. Why? Because of a lack of time. Okay, what about some other ones? Well, how about a lack of talent? Sometimes we feel like, you know what, I, I, I'm not good enough. I, I don't have the talent or the skill to do what I need to do. How about resources? That's a big one. Sometimes we just feel inadequate. I don't have enough money. I don't have the resources. I could never start a business because I don't, I don't have the startup costs. I can't do it. Why? Because I'm lacking the resources necessary. Sometimes those resources could be knowledge. I, I, I don't know how to do it. Therefore, I'm not going to do anything. And we just lay down and surrender defeat because we don't have what we think we need. Or even wisdom. Sometimes we know what to do, but we don't know how to do it, so we don't do anything. Anybody other than Pastor Dan find themselves in that predicament sometimes? You know what you should be doing? You just don't know how to do it, so therefore, don't do anything, right? And we sit there, and, and it's almost like we just say, okay, devil, and we open up the gates, come on in, plunder the city, kill it, and, you know, and just wipe me out. It's all right, you know? And yet God doesn't want us to surrender to lack. Because our God is a God of infinite resources. Our God is a God of in, infinite wealth, infinite wisdom, infinite knowledge. I mean, God knows everything. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And if God can take care of the universe, I think God can take care of our lives. What do you think? Yeah. Mark chapter 6, if you will. Mark chapter 6, verse 31 through verse 44. We'll read and we'll talk about it as we go. We find Jesus, the, the disciples just come back to him. He's just heard that, uh, that uh, John the Baptist was beheaded. And so... His disciples came back to him. His disciples are all excited, and they come to him. They said, Jesus, listen to what happened, you know. And he says, okay, guys, we've been doing a lot. Let's, let's go away. And we find it in verse 31. And he said to them, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they did not, did not even have time to eat. Right off the bat, we find out that Jesus and his disciples are lacking some things. Number one, they're lacking rest. So fatigue could be setting in. They're tired. Sometimes when you're tired, you get weary. Sometimes when you're weary, you make bad decisions. So here Jesus says, I, I, we're, we're lacking in this area of rest, and they don't even have time to eat. So they're lacking time, and also they're lacking energy. They're lacking that sustenance. They need to eat some food, the natural things. And so Jesus knows that we need to take care of ourselves, and so he says, come away to a deserted place. Very interesting, very interesting to me that Jesus takes them to a place of lack to teach them something. Think about that for a moment. Jesus brought them to a place that was lacking. See, he didn't say, let's come over to a city. Oh, let's go over to that oasis over there that has waterfalls and plenty of food and, you know, there's a whole bunch of couches that we can lay down on and sleep. No, he said, let's go to a deserted place. So here Jesus is, and how many of you know God doesn't do anything by accident? It's all by design. So Jesus is leading his disciples into a place of lack to teach them something. Wow. Very interesting. For there were many coming and going, they did not even have time to eat. Verse 32, so they de departed to a deserted place in the boat, 
by themselves. Verse 33, but the multitudes saw them departing, and many knew him and ran there on foot from all the cities. They arrived there before them and came together to him. So in other words, here Jesus launches out from the boat, and all the people that were following said, okay, where is he going? Well, let's see. If he goes that direction a little bit long, it looks like he's going to land right over there. And they ran around the lake to get to the place where he's going so that when Jesus showed up, they said, hey, I didn't know you were going to be here. How crazy. Well, you know, since you're here, come on over here. Come on, come on, hang with us. Look at the response of Jesus. Jesus doesn't say, oh, man, okay, turn the boat around, let's go back. You know, he doesn't do any of that. Look at what, what Jesus does. Verse 34, and Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. See, Jesus sees the multitudes and he doesn't get bugged or annoyed or doesn't get mad at them. No, he has compassion on them. Why? Because they were lacking something. What were they lacking? They were lacking a shepherd. Jesus is the great shepherd. So Jesus starts to teach them, starts to lead them, starts to feed them with the bread of life, the word of God. Wow. Verse 35, when the day was now far spent, once again, here's another area of lack. The day is now far spent. There's no more day left. It's getting late. When the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place. And already the hour is late. Now, they knew that because Jesus said, we're going to go to a deserted place. So then they get there, and disciples point out the obvious. Jesus, this is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Verse 36, send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. Now, the disciples didn't have time to eat. These people have nothing to eat. Once again, we see another area of lack. So they say, send the people away. Let them go into the surrounding villages. Let them go by themselves something to eat. Verse 37, but he, speaking of Jesus, answered and said to them, you give them something to eat. Now, I love reading this in, in the different gospels because Jesus already knew what he was going to do. You can read that in the gospel accounts, that Jesus already knew what he was going to do in this instance. I almost picture Jesus with a little smirk on his face, kind of like there's an inside joke between him and the Holy Spirit that he's about to let the disciples in on, you know, and he just can't wait to do this. He can't wait to, to do what he's about to do, and yet he doesn't want to give away the punchline too soon. So here come the disciples, and they're complaining, they're bawling, they're squalling. Eh, it's a deserted place. Why do we come here? Listen, send these people away. We haven't even had time to eat ourselves. Let them go into the cities. They don't have anything to eat. Let them go buy themselves some bread. Jesus says, you give them something to eat. I can imagine the disciples thinking to themselves, okay, me? Give them something to eat. Um, right. Okay, Jesus. What's brewing, right? And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? Now, really what they're saying is, 200 denarii, we don't know what that means. We think that that was at $200. What was that? That was actually half a year's wages. So they say, shall we take six months worth of wages? That's actually a lot of money. Shall we take tens of thousands of dollars and go buy them something to eat? Really? And, and, and actually, if you read the other accounts, they say, but what is that among so many? They say even half a year's wages wasn't really enough to feed everybody that was there. Verse 38, but... He said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. See, now Jesus is starting to implement the plan. He's starting to reveal to them what's going on. And when they found out, they said, five, and two fish. Now, if you read the book of John, you know it was a little boy showed up with his lunch, right? And here he had these little five loaves and two fish. And so they said, we, we got this, but what is that among so many? Five and two fish, verse 39. Then he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in ranks in hundreds and in fifties. Verse 41. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves, and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fish he divided among them all. Verse 42. So they all ate and were filled. Verse 43. And they took up 12 baskets full of fragments and of the fish. Verse 44, now those who had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men. Now this is a miracle that took place. Jesus is standing, looking to heaven, 
giving thanks, blessing the bread, he breaks it. And as he breaks it and distributes it to his disciples, now the disciples take that broken piece and they take it over and there's a group of 50 men and they say, okay, here's some for you, but listen, don't, don't take too much. Don't, because there's all these people got to eat too. And so they're, they're distributing and they say, okay, here you go. And, and, and as they're distributing, they, they, they keep going and, 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 and all 50 of those people all, all got a piece. So, okay, well, let's see. Well, Jesus, do you have any more of that bread? And he's, he says, yes, here you go. Go, go give that. Oh, okay. So they take it and they go. And, and they, okay, and well, well, here you go. And, and, and okay, here. And, and, and they start distributing. And okay, and you want some more? All right, here you go. I, I think we got enough. And they go back. And, and, and Jesus, do you have some more? Oh, we got to go over here now. Okay. And so they're, they're breaking the bread and they're handing it out. And as they are distributing it, there is a miracle taking place that in a deserted place, in an area of lack, with not enough, now all of a sudden, it's placed in the hands of the Almighty God, Jesus Christ, and as he breaks it open and he distributes it, now all of a sudden, it feeds the multitudes. Thousands. Thousands. 5,000 men. That means women and children weren't even counted. So that means there could have been ten to 12,000, maybe even 15,000 people sitting on the grass eating bread and fish. My goodness. What is God trying to teach us? What is Jesus trying to teach us through it all? Well, Jesus is actually calling them to a place that was lacking in resources to have them stay there a while. And the lesson is in our lack. See, when the devil comes in, the Bible says that like a flood, the Spirit of God will raise up a standard against him. See, we need to recognize and realize that the attacks of the enemy are not just mean-spirited. They're not meant to defeat us. No, they're meant to make us stronger and to grow us in faith. And listen, the chump's already defeated are you hearing what I'm saying? The devil has already been defeated. So that means anything he is doing on the earth is, the, is because we're allowing it on the earth. We are now ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ on the earth. So if the devil is doing something, we have the wisdom of God. We have the word of God. We have the weapons of our warfare now to go in, to fight the fight, to have every resource available to us that we need. God just needs us to get in line with his word. Are you listening? See, the Bible tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 3, that God has given to us all things pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. That means that when we look at Jesus and when we see Jesus, now we see the Father, we see his intent, we see his purposes. And we understand that in a lacking place, Jesus showed off and showed his disciples and showed the multitudes who God is and how God operates and so in our lives, when lack comes, we need to attack the lack. Are you listening? In our lives, when an attack of lack comes, we need to attack the lack. So a couple of things I see in this story today that we need to do in order to attack the lack. If we are going to go after this thing, if we're going to go through this thing, and when that siege comes against our lives, and now there's a battle against us, and we're lacking resources, we're lacking talent, time, wisdom, energy, whatever it is, that we can go after and attack the lack. couple of things for tonight. Are you ready? All right, a couple of you guys are. How about the rest of you guys? Are the rest of you guys ready? Amen. Amen. There you are. All right. Praise the Lord. How to attack the lack. Number one is you got to get organized. Got to get organized. Think about this. Jesus gets them organized. He says, first of all, find out what you do have. Don't look at what you don't have. There's no food here. It's a deserted place. We're lacking. See, when you start getting your eyes on those things, you start getting discouraged. You start to get in doubt. You start to get in fear. You start to calculate in the natural. Jesus said, I don't want you to do that. Find out how many loaves you have. Where are you starting with? See, you have to have something to place into the hands of God even to get going. So don't look at what you don't have. Start looking at what God has given you. If you have a little strength, at least you got some strength, right? If you have a little wisdom, a little knowledge, if you have a little verse, if you have a little scripture, if you have a little word from God. See, one word from God is powerful enough to change the world. One word from Jesus commanded Peter to walk on the water. How much more can one little word from God do in your life? See, that's what this is really all about. What do you have, saints? We get so caught up in what we don't have, and we compare with other people, and we compare with other Christians, and we compare with the world, and as we look around, we start to get discouraged, and yet God is saying, get organized. Find out what you do have. Notice that God is a God of order. He's not a God of chaos. 
And oftentimes in chaotic situations, you can't even see what's really around you. It's like my desk. Man, when my desk is disorganized, can't find a single thing. But once I start putting papers and sex, I needed this. I didn't know I had. Oh, where's this been? You know, you start finding stuff that you want, you know, and all of a sudden you realize that you're not lacking in that area anymore. Now all of a sudden you can know what's going on. So, well, Jesus commanded them, right? What does he command them to do? To sit down and rank. Sit down in groups of 50 and 100. Why? Because they're about ready to manage a miracle. And, and God wasn't going to have chaos. No, God wanted order. God wanted everything to be done decently. God wanted it to be recorded. God wanted it to be just totally orderly. Why? Because God is OCD? No, because God wanted us today to recognize and realize that there were 5,000 men and women and children who were all fed. Why? Because that builds our faith. It shows us how great our God is. It builds appreciation. And now all of a sudden we can recognize and realize that no matter how big the task, how big the scenario, well, how big the problem, how deep the lack, how deep the hurt, it doesn't matter why because my God is bigger than all that and he can supply for all of that. Wow. So he says, get organized. Think about what they had. Think about what they had. The disciples had five loaves, two fish, thousands of people, and one miracle-working God. And that was a recipe for success in their lives. You there, and Mark, turn with me to the book of Proverbs. Maybe just know how to get back to Mark. Put your finger there or something. We'll go back maybe a little bit here and there. Proverbs chapter 27. Great section of Scripture. See, God never called Christians to be brainless or to be mindless. God wants us to be involved. God wants us to know what's going on in our lives. God wants us to be able to account for what's happening. Proverbs chapter 27. Proverbs chapter number 27. Starting in verse number 23, it says this. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 23, it says, Be diligent. Everybody say, Be diligent. See, it says, don't say be lazy. God never called us to be lazy. God has some promises for sluggards in the word, okay? So he says, be diligent to know. Everybody say no. The state of your flocks. What does that mean? Your wealth, what you have. Be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend. Everybody say attend. Attend. Attend to your herds. See, you can't just float through life. As much as we would like to, As much as it's easy and whatever happens, happens, that's not going to work. God says, I want you to be diligent, I want you to know, and I want you to attend to this. Look at verse 24, for riches are not forever. See, there will be lack that comes to your life. We all know that 2008 hit, and we all said, what happened to all of our wealth? Stock market crashed, we all said, what happened to 401k? Real estate values plummeted, we said, what happened to our equity? There's a lot of lack going on. Riches are not forever. Nor does a crown endure to all generations. See, it's not always going to be that certain political party that's in office in our country. We're not always going to have it be. There is change that's continually happening on the earth. Things come up, things go down. Look at what it says, verse 25. When the hay is removed and the tender grass shows itself and the herbs of the mountains are gathered in, verse 26, the lambs will provide your clothing. And the goats, the price of a field. So what is he saying? He says, if you know the state of your flocks and you attend to your herds, then when all the old stuff is removed and new stuff starts coming up, it's from your flocks, it's from that attention, from knowing what's going on, from being organized in that area of your life, that now you are going to receive your sustenance. You get it? Your clothing, he calls it, and as well, what you're going to eat. Verse 27, you shall have enough goat's milk for your food, for the food of your household and the nourishment of your maidservants. What does that mean? That means that this is not just enough for one person, you, right? Oftentimes we're only thinking of it ourselves. But anybody that has a family knows that it's not just me. I've got other mouths to feed, right? So if you know the state of your flocks, if you're being diligent, if you're attending to your herds, then when the new stuff comes up, then that flock now is going to provide for your clothing, provide for your business to buy a field, right? But also it's going to feed you, it's going to feed your family, and it's going to feed the people that are dependent on your life, your maidservants. Isn't that amazing? 
See, that's, that's when Jesus divided to the disciples and the disciples divided to the multitudes. Now there was nothing lacking. There was more than enough for everybody. That's what God is talking about, that as we get organized, now it's not just enough for you, but it's enough for your family, and it's enough to bless those around you. Can anybody say amen tonight? Wow. God is good. So how to attack the lack? Number one is get organized. Organization is not a bad thing. It's tough, yes, and for some of us creative types, it can be difficult. Yeah, it might hurt a little when you think. That's okay. Push through the pain. You can do it. I know I had to. My goodness, my wife can say a big amen to that. How to attack the lack. Number one, get organized. Number two, ask the Father. Ask the Father. Notice back there in Mark, if you will, let's just go back there. Mark chapter 6, once again. Here Jesus has the bread in his hands, and look at what he does. Verse 41. Mark chapter 6, verse 41. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, what did he do? He looked up to heaven. They were organized. They knew what they had. Everybody was sitting down. Now what's he do? He looks up to heaven. See, Jesus knew where the source was coming from. We ought to be wise enough to follow Jesus' example. Not look to our own resources. Not look to the people around us to provide. Not look to what's going on in the world. Why? Because you'll get depressed. Remember, when we get organized, we start to find out what we have. But then you don't look to what you have to provide for you. If Jesus would have looked to the five loaves and started dividing that up, they'd have been out real quick. And there'd have been a lot of people hungry that day. And yet Jesus doesn't look to the loaves, doesn't look to himself, doesn't look to his disciples. No, what does he do? He looks to heaven. He looks to the Father. He looks to the one who has the power to do something. And now as he looks to the Father and he blesses it and he breaks it, a miracle takes place. In other words, church, we've got to keep our eyes on the Father. We've got to keep our focus to heaven. We've got to always keep in mind the things of God. Why? Because if you look to the world, it's going to fail you. If you look to people around you, they're going to desert you. If you look to what you have, it's going to be lacking. And yet, if you look to the Father, the Bible says, I lift up my eyes to the hills from where does my help from come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. God is able, church. God is able to take care of the lack. And if you're going to attack the lack, this is not in your own strength. It's not in your own power. You've got to do it in the power of God. Philippians chapter 4. Turn there with me real quick. Philippians chapter 4. We were there last week with Dr. Paul. Dr. Paul for us gringos. Philippians chapter number 4. Great section of scripture. And in Philippians chapter 4 verse number 19... Great verse to put to memory, and if you're lacking, man, start proclaiming this verse over your life. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 19 says this. He says, and my God shall supply all your need. How? According to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. See, this, this is not about us having material wealth here on the earth it's not about us in our own supply, our own strength. No, my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. When you don't know how you're going to make it and the bills need to be paid, you start declaring, my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. When you don't have the wisdom that you need and you're lacking in the knowledge to get the job done, my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. When you don't know what to do, the children have just gone astray and, and, and you feel like a failure, you're lacking in the parenting skills, my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. See, we need to keep our eyes fixed fixed and focused on heaven, not on our lack, not on our lead. If we look to those areas, we're going to get discouraged and depressed, but God is able. In other words, get it out of your hands and get it into God's hands, and he will take care of the lack. Are you listening? See, the more you hold on to it, no miracles happen here. But when I place it in the master's hands, and when he blesses it, and when he breaks it open, now all of a sudden a miracle takes place, and there is more than enough. Amen? Amen. How to attack the lack. Number one is get organized. Number two, ask the Father. Number three, I like this one. Number three, keep a grateful heart. Keep a grateful heart. It's always awesome to me to see the prayers throughout the Bible. All throughout the Bible you read, I give thanks to my God. I give thanks. I, I have a grateful heart. And here Jesus is, and in Mark's gospel, it doesn't record this, it just says he blessed it. But if you read in the book of John, it says, when he had given 
thanks. Now, we know how we bless our food at the table, right? My kids have this formula prayer every time we sit down at the table. We sit down and it says, who wants to pray? And all three of them raise their hands. And I say, okay, go ahead, because I know that in unison, all three of them in their cute little voices are all going to say, thank you, God, for our food. Bless it to our bodies. In Jesus' name, amen. And then it's time to eat after that, right? And so we know when we bless our food, what do we do? We give thanks. And that in our giving of thanks, that there's a blessing that takes place on our life. See, God loves grateful people. That's why the Bible tells us that God is unwilling to abandon a cheerful giver whose heart is in his giving. What does that mean? That means that I'm excited. That means that I'm happy. That means that I'm grateful. Wow. See, you almost can't say thank you without a smile without knowing that, my goodness, God, it's all because of you. God, you've given me everything that I have. God, I'm so thankful. God, you are God. God, you've been good to me. God, you've led me through the lack. God, you've led me through the wilderness. God, you've taken care of me. And therefore, God, thank you. Thank you. And here Jesus is, and before the miracle takes place, he looks to heaven and he says, thank you, Lord. Thank you for what we do have. See, in a society where when lack comes... It's ungratefulness. God didn't provide. God didn't bless. God didn't do. And we start looking at what isn't taking place rather than looking at what we have and saying, God, I'm so grateful. God, I'm so thankful. So thankful to be born where I'm born and live in this time, God. God, I could have lived in another time where it was persecution. God, I could have lived in another place where it was persecution. There are Christians dying today. There are Christians in prison today, right now, believing God wondering what's going to happen to them, wishing that they had pages of the Bible, and yet we're so rich in the American church that we have not only one Bible, but we can break out our smartphone and we can look up several translations. We've got church that we can come into freely. See, there's so much that we have, church. We're so rich. Pastor Richard, uh, our youth pastor here, broke out some stats in our staff meeting, started talking about the world currency calculator, world wealth calculator. You could find out what percentage of wealth you are. And my goodness, we're in like the top 4% here in America. In our poverty level, it's the top 4% of the world. We ought to be grateful. We ought to be grateful that God has blessed us to live where we live in the time that we live in. And when we look at the stuff that we have, when we start to get organized and we see what God has placed in our hands, and then when we look to heaven, we ought to not say, God, why didn't you give me more? God, why didn't you pour out the blessing? God, what's going on here? I thought I prayed. I thought I believed. No, start to say, God, I thank you for what you placed in my hands, and now, God, I bless it, and I speak to it that my God will supply my need. God will take care of my lack. See, now all of a sudden God has something to work with. Why? Because God's unwilling to abandon a cheerful giver whose heart is in his giving. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, great little verse, 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. In everything, give thanks. Hold on, maybe you missed that like I did the first time I read it. In everything, give thanks. In everything, what does everything mean? Everything, everything right? So that means in good times, give thanks. That means in bad times, give thanks. That means in abundance, give thanks. That means in lack, give thanks. That means when you have enough for you and a friend, give thanks. When you got enough for you, give thanks. Share with a friend anyway. Hallelujah. Maybe God will do a miracle in your hands. Praise the Lord. In everything, give thanks. Look at this. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I've heard so many people say, Pastor Dan, I don't know the will of God for my life. I don't know what to do with my life. Now, you may not be able to go to the Bible and find out what school you're supposed to go to, where you're supposed to live, you know, the house that you're supposed to purchase. You're not, you may not find, you know, who you're supposed to marry and all that kind of stuff. You may not find all that in the Bible. But I will tell you one thing, that in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. <laughs> Want to know what the will of God is? Start by saying thank you. Start right there, and then God will reveal the rest. God will take care of the rest. Can you say amen? amen. Last one for tonight. Last one for tonight. You guys still here? Amen. Praise the Lord. Last one. Walk in faith and obedience. Walk in faith and obedience. It took faith for the disciples to go to Jesus, receive the bread. They, they only had five loaves. It took faith to believe that Jesus was able to do something. And it took faith for them to take that bread and obedience to walk over and to distribute it. What did they do? They heard the word of the master. 
and they walked out on the word and they did what he had called them to do and a miracle took place. Wow. Same thing happened at a wedding supper. You remember here Jesus is attending a wedding and his mother comes to him and says, hey, there's no more wine. Jesus says, well, woman, my time's not come yet. And what does she do? She turns around to the servant and says, whatever he says to you, do it. Right? Here's faith, believing that Jesus is who he says he is. Mary knew who he was from before the time that he was born. So she turns around and in faith speaks whatever he says to you, do it. And then in obedience, they walk and they go and they prepare the large pitchers of water. And you know what happened as they drew out. It turned the water into wine. And now all of a sudden, the master of the feast comes and says, my goodness, you guys saved the best for last. Why? Because it was blessed of God. And so in our lives, if we can walk in faith and obedience, that's when the miraculous takes place. See, sometimes we're waiting for God to do a miracle, and God says, I need you to get the condition for a miracle. I need you to get organized. I need you to look to heaven. I need you to have a grateful heart, and then walk in faith and obedience, and bang, the miracle's going to happen. We can set the stage for the miraculous in our lives. We can believe God for great things, but we can also get out there and put legs to our faith. Walk in faith and obedience. Last verse for tonight, Proverbs chapter 11. Verse 24, it says, There is one who scatters, yet increases more. And there is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. You say, how does that speak to faith and obedience? Listen, every time somebody scatters, they have to believe that the conditions are going to be right, that they've prepared everything. And you think about a farmer. Here he has to do tons of stuff. He has to, first of all, have a plot. He's got to have a place. Second of all, he's got to prepare the soil. He's got to get the rocks out of it, got to make sure he has the rows in the right order. Everything's all lined up. And then he's got to take seed, and he's got to scatter that seed, and he's got to believe that the rain, he's got to believe that the heat, he's got to believe that the seasons are all going to be right in order to produce fruit and bring a crop that's going to bring increase into his life. So there's one who scatters in faith and obedience, and look at this, yet increases more. But on the other side of that, if we hold back and if we don't do it God's way, it says, and there is one who withholds more than is right. Now, we would think the one who scattered would have less. Why? Because they took this much, they scattered it, and now they don't have any left. And yet they, they increase more. But the one who withholds more than what is right, they should have more. They should have this much. Look at what it says. But it leads to poverty. Why? Because they use it up and that resource is gone. See, oftentimes when we're lacking, we pull back from faith. Oftentimes when we're lacking, we pull back from the things of God and pull back from obedience the way God would have us, uh, have us to. Many times I hear people say, you know what, I couldn't afford to tithe. Oh, no, no, no. Listen, you can't afford not to tithe. Why? Because that's withholding more than what is right. That's God's right way of doing it, and that leads to poverty. And yet the one who scatters will increase more. My wife and I were just talking about this many times when lack comes into our finances. When we start noticing that there's something going on, there's a lack here, what's taking place, and we recognize and realize this is a demonic attack. We rebuke that thing. We break that thing off. We bring God into the equation. We say, God, listen, we're bringing you into remembrance of your word. We're tithers, Lord. You said you'd open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on us so much so that we can't contain it. And God, you said you would rebuke the devourer on our behalf. Now, Lord, there's lack in our finances, but listen, we don't stop there. Oh, no. Then we walk in faith and obedience, we continue to tithe, and then we start to give offerings. And we say, you know what? Hey, I'm lacking right now, but here's what I do have. I got this, and I'm going to put this in the offering plate. Oh, what, devil? You, you didn't like that? Well, here's another one, right? And so we start to give it away. We start to looking for people that we can bless. We start to say, hey, you know what? Uh, you know what? Oh, man, we're, you know, we don't have that much finances right now, and everybody's birthday's going on. And after a while, we get frustrated. We say, no, that's not how God wants us to live. God wants us to be generous. And so all of a sudden we start just buying gifts and we go out there and we make it happen. And you know what? God has never let us down. God's bought increase. Why? Because there's one who scatters yet increases more. Church, as we walk in faith and obedience, put it out there. Do God's will God's way. God brings the increase into our lives. What did we learn tonight? Well, we learned that there is an attack of lack that can come against our lives. It comes in a lot of different ways. We're not unaware of the devil's schemes. 
Therefore, we've got to attack the lack. How do we do that? Number one, we've got to get organized. Know what we have. Know the state of our flocks. Number two, we've got to ask the Father, look to heaven. Put it in God's hands. He'll take care of the lack. Number three, we've got to keep a grateful heart. Man, it's all about your heart. Stay thankful. Stay grateful. And finally, walk in faith and obedience. Do God's will, God's way. If you've got something from the word of the Lord tonight, come on, give God a great big praise. I'm going to ask you a question before you leave. You guys were great tonight. I appreciate you guys. And I just want to thank you for allowing me to, to preach the word to you. We've had a great time in church, great time in worship and praise, great time in the word. Let's not stop there. I want to make sure before you leave this place that if you died, that you would go to heaven and not end up in hell. That's really why I'm yelling at the people outside too because it's so important that if you're out there in the breezeways, you're out there headed to your car, stop right where you're at and listen up. If you're in the foyer, come on. Stay put for a moment and listen up. Your eternal life's at stake. Where would you end up if you died tonight? Just answer that question in your heart. No, 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 the answer, but you and God. Where would you be? Would you end up in heaven or would you end up in hell? I don't think anybody in this place wants to go to hell, but sometimes people say, you know what, pastor, I don't believe in hell. And I know God is good and loving and therefore everybody's going to heaven. But don't you think that God, the creators of the heavens and the earth, the one who wrote the plan of redemption, who was a beaten, bloody mess, hung on a cross, don't you think that if he did all that, that he would tell us how to get to heaven? And do you think he just leaves it up to us, whatever way we want to get there, do whatever you want to do, and you get to end up in heaven? Listen, all throughout the Bible it speaks about hell. Old Testament, New Testament, you'll find Jesus talking about hell. It's a very real place. And just by saying that you don't believe that it exists doesn't make it any less real. It's like saying, I don't believe in semi-trucks. If you go stand out on the slow lane of the freeway, you're going to meet one face-to-face -face sooner or later. So you can't just say, I don't believe in hell and just deny its existence, and then you don't end up there. Listen, come on, let's find out how to get to heaven. Sometimes people think, well, whatever way you want to go to heaven, you get to go there. You stick to your truth, and as long as you're true to yourself, God knows, and therefore you're going to get there. But remember, God doesn't just leave it up to any of us. He doesn't leave it up to you or me or some well-meaning church committee. Went through all that, went through the cross, and now he tells us how to get to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by me. What does that mean? That means it's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. Can't do it your way. Can't do it my way. Can't do it some well-meaning church committee's way. We've got to get there God's way. Now, sometimes people say, well, that's good news because, you know, I've been a good person, done a lot of good deeds in my life. Used to be bad. You know, I was messing around, but I, I cleaned up my act. Now I've done more good than bad in my life. I helped out, gave money to charity. It's been nice to my neighbors. You know, and, and I drink water that digs wells in different parts of the world, wear shoes that put shoes on kids' feet in different parts of the world. And I, I've been a part of good causes and social justice, and therefore I know God's watching and God's going to let me into heaven because I've been really good. The problem with that thing is, you know that nowhere? Check it out. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're good or you're nice or you clean up your act, do more good than bad that you get to go to heaven. God doesn't talk about getting involved in social justice or any of those things, even though I think they're great and they're wonderful and we ought to do those things. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible to say that gets us into heaven? In fact, the Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not going to get there by being good. Can't be good enough. Why? Because the standard is perfection and the only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. And our goodness compared to God's goodness is like filthy rags, going to be thrown out. Not going to make it to heaven just by being good. And tonight, let me love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Now, some of you said, well, you know, yeah, I get that. But, you know, I was raised in church. Parents told me you were Christians growing up. Took me to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism or Sabbath school class. Maybe they hung a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized or christened as a child. And you're born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, Right? wrong. You know that nowhere in the Bible say your parents tell you you're a Christian, raise you in church that makes you a Christian? Nowhere in the Bible say that they take you to religious classes, hang religious jewelry around your neck, have you baptized or Christian as a child, or that you're born in America, that your citizenship here in America guarantees you citizenship in heaven. It doesn't work like that. And again, I find nowhere, nowhere, check it out, nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're not some other religion that by default God lumps you into the category of being a Christian headed for heaven and denying your presence in hell that's how you think you're going to get there you're not going to make it tonight I love you enough to tell you the truth you say I get that but you know not only when I was a child did I go to church here I am sitting in church right now and I consider myself to be a Christian 
Now, while I'm very glad that you're here tonight, did you know that nowhere in the Bible say your church attendance gets you into heaven? Nowhere in the Bible say sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. It's like saying I could go down to Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles, sit in the dugout, wear the uniform, bring my bat and my ball, and say I'm a Dodger and think that I'm going to get to play in the game. Listen, it doesn't work like that. You know what's going to happen? They're going to find me sitting there, drag me out, and lock me up. Why? Because at no point in time will I ever have been a part of the Dodgers organization. Can't just sit in church service, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. You say, but okay, I, I understand that. But you know what? Uh, my last church, I got involved. I helped out. I sang in the choir for a number of years. Taught in the Bible classes. People thought of me as a leader. I even got a membership card to that church. That's great. I'm glad you listened. Just, just show that to me in the Bible, could you? It's not there. Nowhere in the Bible say you help out, carry the pastor's the Bible, make decisions, teach in the Bible classes, sing in the choir. People think of you as a leader that you get to go to heaven. It's not there. God is not looking for membership cards to a church before you enter the gates of heaven. Not going to make it. Some of you say, I, I get all that. I understand all that. But somebody told me that if I knew God, I'm a Christian. I know God. I know about Jesus, Easter and the resurrection, celebrate Christmas and sing the songs every year of my life. I could even quote scriptures to you from the Old and the New Testament. And while that's great and I'm glad you can do those things, you know that nowhere in the Bible say your head knowledge, knowing who God is, gets you into heaven? It doesn't work like that. In fact, if you'd read your Bible, you know the demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible records the devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures. Read that in the Bible. And yet he's not a Christian headed for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. Look right here. doesn't matter what you have in your head. This is not about head knowledge, about who Jesus is. And that gets you right with God because you can sing some songs or quote some scriptures and you know who God is. Listen, everybody in America knows who God is. Everybody celebrates Christmas and Easter, but yet not everyone is a Christian. So it doesn't matter what you have in your head. It matters what you've done with your heart. Jesus was speaking to a religious leader of his day who was a good guy, did a lot of good deeds, was raised up in his church, got involved and became one of the leaders. He could quote the scriptures. He could sing the scriptures. How many of us could do that? He could debate the scriptures. He was a teacher in Israel. If we either thought anybody knew God and knew something about the Bible, it was this guy. He did good deeds. He gave his money. And yet when Jesus comes and speaks to this great man of Israel, he doesn't pat him on the back and say, hey man, you're doing a great job. Just keep doing what you're doing and I'll see you in heaven. No, he doesn't say that at all. Rather, what does he say? He says, you want to enter the kingdom of heaven? You must be born again. It's no different today. Now I know sometimes we hear that word being born again and it turns us off because we've seen Hollywood movies and television. We've read books and magazines and internet articles and we've heard about those people, right? Those weirdo, crazy, born again people and we don't want to have any part of that. And yet let's not let the world and society and pop culture define what being born again is. What does being born again mean from the Bible? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's that simple. It's an all-or-nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me prove it to you in the book of Revelation. Last book in the Bible. Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot, or I want to find you cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what's he saying? What's he talking about? Lukewarm. What's that all about? Well, it's a little bit in, a little bit out. A little bit up, a little bit down little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. Why do I say look out? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, in a moment, I'm going to do this. I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm going to count to three and pop my hands together just like this. One, two, three, bang. When you hear that sound, Bang! That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Yeah, you might be. Let's get over that embarrassment tonight. Why? Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever? And ever, and ever, and ever, no one would make that trade. Yet the devil's going to try and talk you out of this. Flesh is going to try and hold you back. Insecurity and pride. Hey, come on, push past all that stuff. Let's go for God tonight. 
Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father. I'm a man, I'll see your hand go up. Count it, you can put it right back down. Probably won't even be embarrassed. Even if you are, it's better than going to hell. But Jesus also said on the opposite end of that statement, if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice. Will you give them all of your heart? Will you give them all of your life? Or will you sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right with God? Your call. I've done my job. I've loved you enough to tell you the truth. God's already done his job, loving you enough to send Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross. Now it's your turn. Will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on tonight and make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never given God all of your heart in your life? Come on. You can do this tonight. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Hey, get ready to make a right relationship with God, acknowledging your need for Jesus by simply raising your hand. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, if you're watching by television in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or online, you can raise your hand right where you're at. And then if you're watching by television in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or listening to my voice, you stopped out there in the breezeways or in the foyer, hey, come on, you can lift your hand and then come back into the church service telling us you're right afterwards. All together on the count of three, I'm going to pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Get ready to get your hands up. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high. There's one, two, three, four. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? There's four wise people already. I see four wise people already. Anybody else? Come on, I didn't embarrass them, and I won't embarrass you. You know you need to do this. Where are you at? I got you. Thank you. Thank you right there. Anybody else real quick? We are at number five. You're sitting there wondering if you should do this. Come on. Yeah, you should. Go for it. Anybody else? Oh, come on. Don't you just know there's more than four people here tonight? Come on. If you're sitting there wondering if you should do this, yeah, God's speaking to you right now. He just called you out. You should do this. Just acknowledge your need for Jesus if that's you. Want to give him all of your heart? Want to give him all of your life? Anybody else? Real quick. Come on. Just pop it up. Just pop it up. Anybody else? Where you at? Anybody else real quick? I just want to give you another opportunity, another moment. I invite you to give God all your heart and your life. Come on, come on. If your heart is pounding out of your chest and you're saying, my goodness, do I need to do this? Yeah, 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 you do. Come on, go for it. Come on, let's go all out for Jesus tonight. Anybody else real quick? Come on, I can't make you do it. I wish I could. I wish I could wave a magic wand over you and you'd be saved. Can't do it. You got to do this. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else real quick? Out in the foyer? How many? One or two? Two? All right. Praise the Lord. That's six. I believe there's two more of you. that You need to give God your heart and your life. Where are you at? Number seven, number eight. You know you need to do this. Come on. Let's get right with God in this safe and friendly place. Listen, I didn't embarrass anybody. I'm not going to embarrass you. Let's go for it tonight. If you know that's you, just simply raise your hand when I'm looking in your direction. Anybody else? Come on. Come on, let's go for it. Number seven, you're sitting there saying, I need to do this. Yep, you do. Come on, faith and obedience. Let's go for it tonight if that's you. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? All right, well, here's what we're going to do. First of all, we're going to rejoice for six people that are ready to give their heart and life to Jesus. That's good. All right? Now, all six of you, if you're number seven, you're number eight, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. In a moment, we're all going to stand. We're going to give a clap. As we do that, if you raised your hand, you should have raised your hand. Here's what I want you to do. Get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, a Bible. Get a hold of a friend if you need a friend. Once you get in the aisle and meet me up front, because we're going to change destinies tonight, but we can't do that till we get you down here. So if that's you, you raised your hand, you should have raised your hand, you come right now. Let's all stand and welcome them. No one leave during this time. Let them come from the foyer. Come on in. Just come to the front right now and make your way down. And anyone who calls upon his name. If that's you and you need to come, just make your way to the front right now. Come on down. They will be saved. From the family room, you want to bring your children, you can. And anyone who calls upon his name, they will be saved. They will be saved. Still come on, let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. Come on, this is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Amen.
Hey, you guys. Thank God you guys have come. Put a smile on your face. This is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Came to give God all your heart and all of your life, all right? Going to be born again, headed for heaven. That's good news. Now, listen, I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine right over here. This is Pastor Joel, right? Or Joel, whatever we want to call him. He's cool. Now, listen, nothing weird is going to go on, okay? You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? This is about as weird as it's going to get tonight, okay? He's cool. Nothing weird is going to go on. I'm going to let you know what he's going to do in advance so that you're not wondering, uh, what, what's going to happen? First thing he's going to do is lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. Second thing he's going to do, give you some free stuff. A couple little booklets our pastors wrote that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Uh, one of them is called Welcome to Your Destiny, Easy Steps to a Successful Future with God. And it'll, it'll just help you to find out, hey, what do I do now that I'm a Christian? You need to sit down and read that. Take it maybe 20, 30 minutes if you read it slow. Listen, we invest a lot of time into movies and television and phone conversations and everything else. You can sit down and invest some time into finding out what to do next in your walk with God. Then finally, he's going to introduce you to a friend we have here in the church that we call a spiritual personal trainer. You say, what's that? Well, you heard of a physical trainer at the gym helps you get strong. Okay. Spiritual personal trainer will help you to develop those muscles spiritually so that you'll be strong in the ways of the Lord. And how they'll do that is they'll meet with you five times before five church services, teach you one thing out of the Bible each time, five things that'll help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. He'll describe how it works. It's easy, it's free, and you need to do it, okay? Now listen, I'm gonna make a promise to you guys. Give us one year of your life here at this church. Just one year sitting under the word of God and the teaching here at The Rock. At the end of that year, you'll look back on this year and for the rest of your life, God will give it back to you and you'll say, I am so blessed. I didn't know it could be like this. Am I telling the truth, everybody? Amen. So if you guys will make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Woo! Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm gonna turn from sin and I'm gonna turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven, as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.